Thank you very much. And yes, he's also had a haircut. So, did anybody, back in 2012, you know, the good old days, did anybody manage to make it to the Olympics? Anyone see the London Olympics? Anyone? A good few people. Did anybody get to the velodrome? Ooh, lucky people. The velodrome was the hottest ticket in town, of course, because the, the velodrome was where the British Olympic cycling team were doing their thing. And, of course, the British Olympic cycling team, and I'm sorry to be uh, patriotic just for a moment, but they were just the best in the world. For those of you who weren't keeping track of the numbers, and I'm a person who does keep track of the numbers, the, the count was 10 gold medals were available. The British Olympic cycling team won seven gold medals. The entire rest of the world put together just got three. Absolutely miraculous result. Now, you may be thinking to yourselves, what, what's the secret? Because, of course, it's, it's not mysterious packages and therapeutic use exemptions. We know that that, that could never be the secret. What is the secret? What, what, because it, it's not just you know, Chris Hoy's thighs or you know, Victoria Pendleton's de determination. Or, I mean, all these amazing athletes, they just seem to produce um, performance after performance after performance. There must be something more systematic going on. But now we know what the secret is. The secret was a gentleman called Matt Parker. Matt Parker, of course, being the man who figured out that if you could rub alcohol on the tires of the bikes, then they would have a little bit more grip and would be slightly faster out of the starting gate, saving valuable milliseconds. He also made the athletes travel with orthopedic pillows and, and made sure they weren't suffering from uh, any allergies and taught them, very important, how to wash their hands. Because you're going to the Olympics, you're going to meet people from all over the world bringing kind of cold germs and flu germs and all kinds of bugs. You need to, and you're going to shake hands with them. So you need to wash your hands, including the thumbs. Make sure you get the thumbs, very important. And he identified that in between the semi-finals and the finals of each event, there was just one hour of recovery time. These are sprint events, generally. So he called this the golden hour, and he focused obsessively on how to improve the recovery rates of the athletes in the golden hour. And when you look at the data, you see time and again that, thanks to Matt Parker, the, uh, the British athlete goes faster in the final than in the semi-final. And the foreign athlete, otherwise known as the silver medalist, <laughs> goes slower in the final than in the semi-final. All of these tiny little things, all of these little ideas adding up to something big. And Matt Parker's job title was Head of Marginal Improvements at the British Cycling Team. Now, I love this idea of marginal improvements, marginal gains. And it turns out it's incredibly popular these days. It's all the rage in Silicon Valley. So whenever you log on to the Amazon website, if Amazon is your kind of thing, what you see, the prices you're shown, the additional uh, products that are displayed to you, the color scheme, the font, it's all being constantly tested. Uh, A-B testing, it's called. A little mini randomized trial, just to see what gets the highest click-through rates. You, you get the same thing in the way that phones work. You get the same thing in uh, Google's, well, pretty much everything Google produces. The chief designer of Google resigned a few years ago after Google A-B tested what the ideal color of blue would be for the hyperlinks and sort of the adverts down the side of the search results. He said, I can't work for a company like this. I'm a designer. And then it subsequently emerged that Google had made a quarter of a billion dollars by identifying the optimal shade of blue. You see, marginal improvements, they're a kind of magic. But I'm worried. I have to admit, I'm worried. And it's not that I don't think marginal improvements work, and it's not that I don't think marginal improvements you know, can't deliver you know, outstanding performance and make the world a better place. They can, of course they can, if they're deployed in the right way. But what worries me is that some of the most important innovations you're never going to get through to with a process of marginal improvements. Let me give you an example. So in the early 1980s, a scientist called Mario Capecchi applied for funding to the National Institutes of Health in the United States, the huge taxpayer-funded body 
They have billions of dollars of grants to give out. They do wonderful, wonderful work. But I think understandable, well, give it understandably given the, the circumstances, they do tend to focus on you know, reliable results. So they want scientists to demonstrate that if they get this money, then they'll, there'll be something to show for it at the end of it. There'll be a, a, a publishable research paper. There'll be some, maybe you'll be just be checking a previous result or, or taking the next small step down the pathway of scientific exploration, which is fine, mostly. It's an important way to spend money. But Mario Capecchi didn't have a marginal improvement in mind. He had a crazy idea in mind. What he wanted to do was to identify a single gene in a mouse and to take that gene, remove it, and replace it with a different gene. Now that's like, imagine this entire room as a library full of books. It's like finding a single book in that library, a single page on that book, a single paragraph, a single sentence, and then editing that sentence out and replacing it with a different sentence. But the whole thing is taking place on a molecular level. And this is properly hard. You're not going to get there with magnifying glasses and tweezers. It seemed like science fiction, especially in the early 1980s. And the National Institutes for Health said to Mario Capecchi, look, you're a great scientist, Mario. We're happy to keep funding your work, but just forget this whole business about this knockout mouse. And so Mario had a choice to make. Was he going to take the National Institutes for Health advice, or was he going to risk his career, his funding, his laboratory on a long shot? And before I tell you the choice he made, I need to tell you a little bit about the history of Mario Capecchi. He was born before the war in Italy. His mother was a dissident. She opposed Hitler, she opposed Mussolini. And when the war began, of course, the Gestapo came for her. And Mario's first memory, aged four, is of the German secret police knocking on his mother's door, arresting her, and taking her away to a concentration camp. Well, where was his father? Well, his father never married his mother. He was a violent man. His mother didn't want anybody, anything to do with him. But somehow, uh, we don't know quite why, Mario doesn't remember, somehow Mario ended up in the care of his father when his mother was taken away. And he later said that there was nothing that happened to him in his entire life that was as painful to him as having a father who was violent towards him. And six weeks later, he ran away. He joined, joined a street gang, running wild the streets of Italy during the war. He's four and a half years old. So he was always getting into trouble, in and out of these gangs, in and out of church hospitals and church orphanages. Feral. And at the end of the war, he has dysentery and he's, he's in hospital. They've taken all his clothes away because they know he'll run away. He's just got a little bit of bread and chicory coffee. That's all he gets every day. And on his ninth birthday, a woman he doesn't recognise arrives at the hospital. And the reason he doesn't recognise his mother is she spent the entire war in Dachau. But she survived. She spent months looking for him. And she's found him. And she takes him away to America, where she has relatives. So he speaks no English. He's been feral half his life. So what happens next? Well, of course, he, um, he goes to Harvard. I mean, <laughs> not immediately, but, you know, in due course. He's brilliant. He works for James Watson, the co-discoverer of DNA. And Watson later says um, that Mario, in two years, achieved more than most scientists achieve in a lifetime. But then Mario left Watson, and he left Harvard. And he set up his own department in the University of Utah, in the middle of nowhere. Why? It's interesting. He said, Harvard had become a bastion of short-term intellectual gratification. Too many smart people trying to impress too many other smart people in a hurry. Too many marginal improvements. And Mario realized that if you wanted to do profound, important, influential work, sometimes you needed to carve out that space for yourself and take a risk on a long shot that might not pay off. Well, you know now what he did when the National Institutes for Health told him not to investigate the knockout mouse. He did it anyway, and it worked, and he won the Nobel Prize for medicine. I mean, of course, you can see all this coming, right? Because this is the kind of story we love. 
We love the bold, stubborn scientist who takes a risk and it all pays off against the odds. But the question I want to ask is, what about the timid scientist who's you know, got a family to feed and nervous about her job or his job? Those people, we ask to take the big risks for us. If the risks pay off, we enjoy the benefits. But if the risks don't pay off, the costs are all on them. It's not fair. This is a disruptive innovation festival. And often, when we talk about disruptive innovation, we think about the impact it has on the world. And yeah, that's important. But disruptive innovation can also mean unpredictable innovation. It can mean long shots. It can mean inventions that change the world at tremendous risk to the careers of the people who pioneer them. So I'm all in favor of marginal improvements. They have their place. We should embrace them. But let's not forget that the long shots matter too. Thanks very much for listening.